always a bit of housekeeping before we begin. The restroom is located in the back right corner. The light is on the outside. Both the front and back doors will stay unlocked for a while. It's always fun as a bookseller to put a face to the books that you've spent years selling. During my time at Bear Pond, Cy Montgomery's books have been a staple in our nature section. Ones that customers have gravitated towards and asked about time and time again. A quick glance at one of her books tells you that she approaches nature writing with humor, passion, and deep knowledge for her craft and her subjects. And the illustrations are pretty special too. So tonight we are beyond thrilled to host two very talented and dedicated wildlife writers and nature lovers, Matt Patterson and Simon. Patterson is a wildlife artist with a true love of art and conservation. He grew up in New Hampshire and received a degree of, from the Art Institute of Boston in illustration in 2006. His father was a biology teacher, so he had a love of animals instilled in him from a young age and was particularly interested in fish and turtles. As a signature member of the artist conservation, he often donates proceeds from the sale of his art to the conservation of endangered animals. He's a naturalist adventurer, and wants to use his art to inspire awe. Cy Montgomery is a New York Times best-selling author, National Book Award finalist, and all-around amazing naturalist. She's a graduate of Syracuse University with a triple major, dual degrees in magazine journalism and French language and literature. Her 34 books, both for adults and children, have garnered many honors. In researching her many books, Cy has been chased by an angry silverback gorilla in Zaire, bitten by a vampire bat in Costa Rica, worked in a pit crawling with 18,000 snakes in Manitoba, and handled wild tarantula in French Guiana. She, she has been deftly undressed by an orangutan in Borneo, <laughs> hunted by tiger in India, and swum with piranhas, electric eels, and dolphins in the Amazon. She has searched the Altai Mountains of Mongolia's Gobi for snow leopards and learned to scuba dive in order to commune with octopus. Her latest book, What the Chicken Knows, comes out on November 5th. You can pre-order now. Please help me in welcoming Matt Patterson and Simon Montgomery. <laughs> It is great to be in a room full of turtle lovers. <laughs> and we know that you really came to see Veruca, who's going to make an appearance a little bit later. But it's, it's such a pleasure to talk to you about this book that was so much fun to research. And one of the things folks always want to know is, you know, how did this book begin? Well, most books actually have several beginnings. And I could pick when I was little, born in the 1950s, you were practically issued one of those little red-eared baby turtles in the plastic terrariums, you know, by the time you were five. And then by the time you were six, your mother had flushed six of them and just rushed back to the store and told you it was the same turtle. So um, we could say that was the beginning. Or when I grew up in Virginia and it would rain in the summer and you would go to the forest by the creek, and you'd find a box turtle, guaranteed back then in the 70s. But really, probably the most important beginning for this book was the happy day I met this guy. <laughs> well, we met about six or seven years ago at an art festival, and um, I started introducing Cy to the world of turtles, and we became really good friends, and we started doing turtle adventures together. We even, we were kayaking in April, looking for turtles, and Cy, uh, this is in Massachusetts, Cy fell out of a kayak in the freezing cold water, but jumped up laughing and happy, so I, I knew that she was good. Um, I've loved turtles since I could speak, and probably before. I grew up, uh, like she said, my, my father was a biology teacher, so I grew up around animals all the time. He was always introducing me to different animals. And I grew up uh, looking for turtles, catching turtles, observing turtles, hatching them, and uh, of course drawing them. And my parents saved some of my earliest drawings in there dinosaurs, turtles, and fish. And they even have a picture of me in front of Myrtle, who's a now nine-year-old, 550-pound green sea turtle. In the mm -hmm. Korean. Has anyone seen Myrtle? Yeah, Myrtle's been around since the 70s. A lot of people have seen Myrtle. <laughs> but my, 
my work, my art has given me the opportunity to travel all over. I've gone to Madagascar with the Turtle Survival Alliance, surveying uh, critically endangered radiated tortoises. Last year I was in Belize in the rainforest, um, surveying turtles there, and which is an incredible place with monkeys and snakes and ants and turtles, and I even took home parasites, so that was one. <laughs> <laughs> So we started doing turtly things together. And soon I felt a book coming on. Actually, three books were coming on. Um, the, the book that was published before of Time and Turtles is called The Book of Turtles. And this is just full of these gobsmacking facts about an animal that everyone knows. But we don't. We think of turtles as slow. People don't think of them as intellectual geniuses. Um, turtles, some species of turtles can actually outrun a 10-year-old in the 100-yard dash. They can sprint 15 miles an hour on land. Yep, they're so fast. You can see the video. The video will astonish you. And there are turtles with necks longer than their shells. Turtles that can climb trees. Turtles that have shells that go in the dark. There's a turtle that can pee out of its mouth. And <laughs> a lot of turtles, especially around here when they're roommating, can breathe out of their butts. So we thought this would be an excellent book. Um, but the bigger book, the book that took three years to live and then write about and then illustrate, was the Book of Turtles, and that's what we're going to concentrate on tonight with you. This was one of my real heart books. I've now, I, I, I keep failing to update my own biography, but I've, I've now written 38 books. And I was talking with Matt just now about, you know, the, the books that you just loved every minute of it. Some of them are actually like pulling teeth at some part. Either the writing is terrible, or the publicity is a drag, or you know, the editor's wiping their glands on and changing the title and it's turned into some horrible title that you hated or, you know, something. But this was one of those books that was just pure joy from day one. What we wanted to do, we wanted to get to know some turtles personally very well and we wanted to talk about turtles in a way that provided a narrative, a story, with a beginning, middle, and end. And you can't know what that's going to be. So um, what this book does is it takes place in various places, but largely at Turtle Rescue League in Southbridge, Mass. And I'm going to read to you, Matt and I both will read to you a little bit from some of the first pages of the book to give you an idea of what our first day was like. Amid all the other homes on this suburban street, some white, beige, gray, light yellow, one two-story salt box stands out. It's a blazing neon green, and its flamboyance was accentuated by an equally electrifying violet shed out back. The house bears a sign that reads, Turtle lover parking only. <laughs> Violators better shut the shell up. <laughs> so parked in the drive is a smart car and a black scion, and both are mounted with strobe lights, like the ambulances that they are. They're emblazoned with the Turtle Rescue League logo, with stickers urging fellow motorists to stop for turtles in the road, help them get across, and they serve as emergency vehicles for transporting injured turtles to the 1,000 square foot turtle hospital that occupies the basement of the home. So observed by closed circuit TV, this is one of several security measures taken because even sick or injured, turtles are so valuable on the black market that these patients could be targets of abduction. Matt and I mount the steps to the wooden deck and we knock on the door. Alexia Bell, Turtle Rescue League's president, lets us in. And once inside, Matt and I carefully step over a knee-high wooden barricade to enter the living room. And we're soon met with the reason for that barricade. 
Pizza Man. A 20 year old, 12 pound red footed tortoise with a knobby black and yellow shell is headed towards us like a slow motion missile. High stepping on columnar legs, his toenails tapping softly on the wooden floor, he holds his pale yellow bottom shell or plaster on tall as he pieces determinedly across the room. He stops two inches from Sai's feet. He pointedly jerks his wizened looking head to the right, holds, holds it still for a second, jerks his head back to the center, and then jerks it to the left. He then swings his neck back to the center and stares up into Sai's face. Such a spirited reaction from a turtle might come as a surprise. While most people like turtles, even many biologists for years dismissed the reptile's intellect as a little more sophisticated than that of a pet rock. <laughs> because turtles are famously slow and spend considerable amounts of time stock still, it's easy to get the impression that they don't think or feel or know much or do much of anything at all. But clearly, Pizza Man is giving a sigh signal and it feels like a welcome. Well, when he reached Matt, he got even more excited because even though it was then February, his feet were clad as they are today in flip-flops. He goes barefoot every, I mean, you see his barefoot prints in the snow in front of his house in February. And this turtle, being a heat-sinking missile, stood right on the skin, the warm skin of Matt's feet to deliver his greeting. And we were awfully glad to get such a warm welcome because we had come to Turtle Rescue League to ask a favor. We'd actually been there once before. We'd come to a meeting called the Turtle Summit, to which animal rescuers who dealt with turtles came from around the region and were presented with all the new, wonderful ways that you can save turtles. And we had left that meeting feeling as if we had just left Lourdes. Alexia had projected a slide of one of their patients, a female snapping turtle. The entire first third of her shell was shattered, three of her legs were smashed, one eye was gone, and she had been lying on the side of the asphalt road where she'd been hit, cooking in the sun for hours. But two years later, she was returned to the wild healed. Quote, what looks like a fatal injury to some animals may be survivable to a turtle, end quote, Alexia told the assembled crowd. Quote, basically, if the turtle's organs aren't smeared all over the road, you might well be able to save her. We never give up on a turtle, end quote. So today we're back. We want to take part in this miracle. We've come asking if, once this busy spring season gets underway, we might be allowed to volunteer at the League's hospital and help broken creatures be made whole. So that was... When we first went to the, the uh, Turtle Rescue League, that was in 2019. By the time we came back to actually volunteer there, a funny thing had happened, and that was COVID-19. And what was so amazing about this was that when I conceived writing this longer book, it was the first real long book that I'd done since my 2015 book, The Soul of an Octopus, which some of you might know. And Soul of an Octopus had been examining not just how cool octopuses were, but the one of two of the big problems in philosophy. Two hard problems have plagued philosophers for centuries. And one of them is the mystery of consciousness, which I explored in Soul of an Octopus. But the other hard problem is the mystery of time. What is it? You know, does it flow through us? Do we flow through it? Does it shoot forward like an arrow? Does it run out like sand in an hourglass? Is it even real? Well, who better to lead you on an exploration of time than these ancient reptiles who arose with the dinosaurs, who have such long lives, and who go about those long lives in an unhurried, wise fashion. And what better time to explore this question than during the pandemic? <laughs> because it was then that all of our markers just seemed to disappear. The clock and the calendar didn't matter anymore. You no, know, 
all the ways we mark our days, you know, holiday gatherings, graduations, even weddings and funerals, poof, gone. So all of us during that era were kind of looking for a different way to connect with time. And this allowed us to do this. So we, we show up volunteering, not having any idea what's going to happen next. Well, one of the first patients we, we worked with was quickly named Robin Hood. Robin Hood was a male staffing turtle. He's about 30 pounds, and he lived in his pond for decades when someone decided to shoot an arrow through his, his neck and shoulder. Yeah, and an animal control officer saw this arrow sticking out of him and called TRL, and Natasha and Alexia quickly dispatched Mike Henry. Mike Henry is a volunteer, and he was told that this turtle was in the water of somewhere of an 80-acre pond. <laughs> That's all he was told. But somehow he found the turtle, he carried it a quarter mile down a gravel path, he drove it two hours back to the headquarters where we saw there wasn't an arrow, it was a bolt from a crossbow. Well, we were waiting for Alexia because she does all the um, procedures because for the very good reason that Natasha is blind. So she was at her other job uh, fixing appliances. So we waited, but we waited with hope because already on our first day, we had seen turtles with terrible injuries that had healed, cracked shells and broken legs and jaws. Um, one of those turtles was Chutney. He was named Chutney, and he was a male snapping turtle, and he was hit by a car, and it had broken his shell, broke his jaw, and it concussed his brain. And so he didn't know which way was up and which way was down. He kept flipping over, he kept rolling over and over. And they tried everything to try to get him to stop doing this, because it was a problem. Every time that would happen, they would have to reset his jaw. And they tried weighing him down, taping him, and nothing worked, until they came up with the Chutney tube. And the Chutney tube was a, a clear plastic pitcher that he kind of fit into perfectly, and the handle of it acted as a kickstand so he couldn't roll over. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually his world stopped spinning, and after, after that he started to heal, and two years later when we volunteered that spring, he was released. We met a turtle we called Mr. Pajamas, who was, he was an endangered spotted turtle, and he had been chewed by a dog, and he was missing so much of his carapace, that's you know, the, the top shell, um, that it kind of looked like he was in his pajamas. Uh, <laughs> but amazingly, after his cracks were reunited with, with um, silver tape and super glue, and they gave him antibiotics because you know a dog chew the infection, he began to heal. And like two or three years later, he was released back to the wild, healthy. So this is why, as we're waiting for Alexia to come home from her day job fixing appliances, we we're waiting with hope for this turtle. Now, many people are deathly afraid of snapping turtles. They think that they're going to bite you. Well, they are not going to bite you. If you pick them up, they might be a little nervous. <coughs> it wouldn't be to have some monster lean over and pick them up, particularly if you're trying to help them cross the road and all of these cars are whipping back and forth. So sometimes snappers do snap at you. Usually, it's just a warning snap. So we're kind of wondering, like, how is Alexia going to get this arrow out of his neck? because his neck is like where his head is and his jaws. Well, it was even worse than an arrow. We actually discovered while we were waiting for Alexia that it was the bolt um, from a medieval weapon that is used to pierce armor. So this was a really serious problem. This guy had every reason to be very upset. So Alexia comes home. She places the turtle on the operating table, turns on the light, looks at his wound. How are you, little guy? So it's actually a big guy. How are you, big <laughs> monster? Sometimes they call him a monster. And she starts twisting and pulling the shaft of this weapon right next to his head. Well, interestingly, it was really stuck in there because his skin had healed around it almost like a, a tree will grow around barbed wire. So she's pulling, she's twisting, she's like squirting lactated ringer solution in there. Turtle's not hissing, turtle's not gaping, turtle's not snapping, just patiently waiting. And finally she gets the thing free. And Mike Henry could take 
Robin Hood back to his pond for release that very afternoon. Wow. So there were so many wonderful success stories that we got to witness. Um, so many great turtles we got to know. But you know, as I was writing this book, I was wondering, well, who's going to turn out to be the turtle hero of this book? Well, it turns out we had met him the very first day, and our favorite turtle, by far, was a guy named Fire Chief. Well, uh, little did we know where a friendship with this turtle would take us. Our first spring of volunteering was, was really busy. We were working at TRL several times a week, but we were also working in a nest protection program, which took place behind the suburban development next to two baseball fields, an asphalt parking lot, a bunch of porta potties, and there a, re a retired school teacher and a part-time librarian I've been leading a team of volunteers for more than 15 years protecting the nests of five different species of turtles, three of which were endangered or threatened. And over the years, they protected hundreds of nests and thousands of baby turtles. So we got to do that with them. We got to, uh, with TRL, tag along and release turtles back to where, once they were healed, back to where they were found. We released uh, hatchlings. We dug up eggs where sometimes in construction sites or in the side of the road where they couldn't really hatch. We bring them back and incubate them. Um, but one of the turtles that we released, we got to go on a release with, was called was called by by uh, TRL. They called him Chunky Chip. <laughs> but his real name from Marblehead, Mass, where he was from, was Tortzilla. <laughs> <laughs> he was so beloved that when he was injured with a fishhook injury, his story made the local paper, and it actually made our paper back in New Hampshire too. And he was a repeat offender. He had been in two years in a row with, with fish hook injuries. And when we released him back to this pond where he had, he's an old turtle, a big turtle, and there's a picture of him in the book, and he had lived there for decades. And when we released him to, back to this pond, everyone in the neighborhood came out to welcome him back. <laughs> he was a really big, and he was a really popular turtle. We had so much fun doing this book. In addition to releasing healed patients and babies, we went down to Turtle Survival Alliance in South Carolina. And there, they are breeding turtles, some of whom are extinct in the wild, in order to repopulate the, the world with turtles who are facing the just terrible conditions of which we're gonna speak shortly. Um, we did a, a turtle uh, rescue of cold stunned sea turtles on the Cape in December during a storm. But our absolute favorite thing to do was when the busy spring was passed, we began to work with Fire Chief. So um, Fire Chief had been hit by a car in 2018, and it cracked his shell and paralyzed his back legs. He had lived in back of a fire station in a fire pond during the summer, and for his winter brumation, he would cross the street and spend the winter in a, a different pond. And this is quite common. When he was hit, um, the firemen, brave men who rush into burning buildings to save you, were so upset that their friend had been injured. But because he was a snapping turtle, they were too afraid to pick him up. <laughs> These are, yeah, these are people who are rushing the burning building to save you. So they called TRL, and these two skinny ladies, one of them blind, came out, and they, they had a kayak, and they launched it, and they found him, and they took him back to the headquarters, and they patched up his shell. And when we met him, it was two years later, so his injury had healed, but his legs still weren't working great. His, his back legs and his tail, turtles can regain, even though he was paralyzed at one point, they still can regain use. And so he started to be able to use them again, but we started doing physical therapy. He was living in a hospital tank, but someone needed to walk him around, and we got that awesome job. <laughs> and he so, even at one point had a wheelchair in the winter that he would use. He had wheels, right. so he would, like a floor like this, he would slide all around it. He loved it. It was so fun coming up with a bespoke wheelchair for a 42-pound snapping turtle. A lot of people helped work on that chair. I know. People in our neighborhood were offering design advice. I mean, everyone loved this turtle. He was just so huge. But I got to tell you, the first time I met him, first time we both met him, um, 
I think Natasha had lifted up the lid to the tank and she dropped in a, a whole unpeeled banana. This immense head, I wrote down that it was the size of my thigh. I mean, it couldn't have been, but it looked that big to me. <laughs> this immense head comes lurching out of the water. And I have been to Bangladesh where estuar and crocodiles lurch out of the water like missiles. That is what it reminded. He murdered that banana. So, you know, I was a little scared of him. Matt said he had a wild appeal. But I want to share with you from, from the book the first time that we took him out of his hospital tank and did physical therapy with this 42-pound wild snapping turtle. Matt hefts the huge turtle over the lip of the tank and into a travel case on the cement floor. Fire Chief's bulk completely fills the bin. To carry him safely up the stairs, we try to, sl to snap a lid on top, but his enormous head pops the seal and pokes out, looking like the T-Rex from the movie Lost World. <laughs> With both Natasha and I pushing hard to urge his head back down and hold the lid shut, Matt walks up the stairs from the basement through the living room and out to the back deck. And here he lifts the huge reptile out of his container and hauls him over the three-foot wooden fence to the turtle garden. Fire Chief is even more magnificent out of water than in. His head is as big as Tortzilla's. His neck is muscular, not fat. His 14-inch long tail sports 11 tall, proud, reddish-brown osteoderms tooth-like bony ridges rising skyward, rather like the spikes on Stegosaurus's tail, but not as sharp. Some of them are a full inch high. His shell is an unusual, gorgeous reddish brown, the color Matt knows from his artist palette, and I from the 1966 deluxe Crayola pack <laughs> as burnt sienna. So the idea was to let him explore and experience full gravity, as Natasha explained. And he seemed really eager to do this. And he's walking around, his neck stretches out fully, his powerful scaly forefeet are doing most of the work. They pull him forward 10, 15, 20 steps, heading towards the edge of the fence. And his mind is obviously clear, there's no brain injury here. He is curious, active, and focused. And we're sticking so close to him because when your back legs don't work, your plastron, your belly shield, may drag on the ground. And normally you would hold it high with your strong back legs, but it can get scraped. So periodically, Matt would heft him up again and Natasha and I would examine his plastron, make sure nothing bad was happening. So at one point he'd been walking around and he just stopped. And he was doing what they call gular pumping. Their throats expand and contract, and they're just inhaling all the scent of the world. Mm -hmm. And it was right then that Matt and I, wordlessly, got the same idea. And it was an idea that probably should carry a warning label, don't try this at home. <laughs> and that is, both of us reach out to stroke this 42-pound wild snapping turtle's head. <laughs> so first, Matt gently strokes his neck, and I touch the surprisingly soft skin near his armpit. You're a big banana cream pie, Matt whispers to him. <laughs> <laughs> finally, with our fingers, we stroke his mighty head. Well, that afternoon, we drove home in the height of the pandemic, in the middle of all the political strife that was tearing our country apart. And yet, we felt full of hope and promise. Well, this is a, a book of hopes and promises fulfilled in turtle triumph. <laughs> it's a tale of people from all different walks of life coming together with their talents and their compassion to do the essential job of mending our world. Turtles are among the most varied, the most beautiful, and the toughest animals on the planet. 
They've been around for over 240 million years. They've been around as long as the dinosaurs. They survived the asteroid impact 66 million years ago. They survived ice ages. But the question is, will they survive us? Because they're also one of the most endangered groups of animals on the planet. And they're threatened by all the usual suspects, like habitat loss to roads, houses, and factories. Roads, obviously, are a real big problem for turtles. Um, pollution, poaching, people taking turtles from the wild, and climate change, too. And that's especially bad for turtles. Many turtles, their sex is determined by temperature. So if it's just a degree or two warmer, they'll get all females. Usually the nest is divided, the top of the nest, the eggs are a little bit warmer, and the bottom is a little bit cooler, and that kind of splits them up. Um, of over the 350 species, over 60% of turtles today are in danger of extinction in the wild. And there's a number of whom are, uh, who are already extinct in the wild. And we got to meet some of those at the Turtle Survival Alliance's center. So this is why we wrote this book. We, we wrote the book to remind people that there, there is healing even in a broken world. And there's so many ways we can do this. For us, to be engaged in the act of mending during this really difficult time, it, it was like a resurrection. It was like a reminder of the resilience of life at a time when many people were languishing and suffering from despair. And it's also an invitation to all of our readers because there's so much that all of us can do to help turtles, including simply helping them cross the road. And most of you probably know this, but you'd be surprised. Some folks, kind-hearted, will pull over, see the turtle going this way, decide the turtle doesn't know what it's doing, turn it around and take it back to where it's coming. And most of the time, at least in the spring, many of these turtles are females, looking to lay their eggs. Well, this is the equivalent of finding a woman in labor hitchhiking to the hospital and taking her back to her office. <laughs> it's not what you want to do. When we protect wetlands, when we protect forests, we're protecting turtles. And when we are protecting turtles, we are helping to uphold the whole health of the earth. One of my favorite paintings that Matt did um, for the, the Book of Turtles and I have a print of this hanging in my office, is of a notion that occurs across cultures around the world, and that's the idea of the world turtle. A lot of cultures have this idea. In fact, North America was called Turtle Island by many of the native people who lived here before Westerners arrived. And the idea was that they are holding up the world. They literally are the foundation for so many ecosystems, and we fail to realize this. If it weren't for sea turtles, we'd be up to our lips in jellyfish. All the coral reefs would die. If it weren't for the gopher tortoise, hundreds of species of animals shelter in the, the dens that they dig and in their under, um, underground tunnels. There are turtles who eat endangered plants that would not be alive if it weren't for them. And in some cases, these are endangered plants that we now know can cure diseases that we can't have a synthetic uh, drug for. Uh, cancers, for example, can be treated with a substance extracted from the seeds of the May apple. And this is a species that's spread by, by turtles. So by writing this love story to turtles, by sharing our journey, we're inviting all of our readers to make like a turtle and hold up our world. Thank you. So we are delighted to take, to take questions. Down, but if you want to start taking questions, yeah, we we'll would love to take questions. Please. Yeah, I know everyone wants to meet Veruca, and Veruca <laughs> is going to come down. And while we verbally answer questions, Veruca will physically answer questions <laughs> as you get a, a close up and personal look at this Russian tortoise. Um, I have learned Veruca is a middle aged male. 
and um, probably in his 30s, they learned that Veruca is a male. You can't tell when they're hatchlings or when they're young. The males have longer tails. I want to hold him. <laughs> I love you. Look at you. So Veruca is a tortoise. We get this question all the time. What's the difference between a tortoise and a turtle? A tortoise is a turtle. No, he's wanting to walk around. He's feisty. Do you want to walk around on the ground? Can you walk around? Let him go. He's going to break that land speed record. Yeah, right. A tortoise is a land turtle. So all tortoises are turtles, not all turtles are tortoises. And everyone can identify a sea turtle. They're all turtles too. Yep, there's seven of them. There are terrapins. Terrapins are turtles that live in brackish water or salt water, fresh water meat. And they're all turtles. I mean, some people are like, oh, today I was on the website. Um, Bring them around in the bin, or would you like to bring them around? To sure. I can hold them up. Yeah. Well, no, let's do a little turtle anatomy. Oh, okay, um, good idea. So, the top of the shell is called the carapace. This is called the bridge to the side, and that is the plaster on the bottom. Um, sometimes males have like a concave plaster on, like okay. a dent in it. You can imagine why. You can imagine why. They may have a longer tail, that's the best way to tell them. Okay. Yeah. Would you like to? Do you want to pass um, in the bin, or you might crawl? I, don't, I mean, maybe I'll just hold them up. Oh, okay. Rather than passing around, they a very handy guy. We'll, we'll leave them out so people can get a good look at them. This is the kind of um, turtle who uh, was the first animal in space. <laughs> yes, the first. Well, not the first animal in space, okay. but the first animal to first. orbit the Earth. Or with the moon. Yeah, we'll get it, we'll get it. Two yeah. Russian tortoises. And they made it back. Yeah, they made it back. Yeah, they made it back. Like Laika, who was this, a dog. This is him releasing air so he can get into a shell. It's not a hiss, it's not like a cat hiss again. <laughs> and second, yeah. I understand it. Yeah. So it yeah. sounds kind of you know, um, why they chose aggressive, but I don't think turtles to go. Why they chose turtles yeah. to go around the wood? I don't know. That's a good question. I, I'm not sure. I, well, turtles are tough. I know that. <laughs> he was gonna make it. He's so beautiful. And yeah, um, he's real I'm healthy. He looks great. <laughs> I, I was wondering because I visited a turtle rescue, a sea turtle rescue place yeah. down in Florida when I was traveling there this winter. And one of the things they were talking about there is that, and this I guess is true of other endangered animals, is that. Um, we're giving them diseases. You know, we're, we're spreading diseases that they're vulnerable to. And I wondered if that was the case with many endangered turtles or turtles that are in rescue situations. Yeah. I don't know if the sea turtles are more vulnerable to it, but they were talking about they have to be careful not to let too many people be around the turtles and um, yeah. handle them and so on and so forth because of the risk of, of spreading disease. Yes, yeah, well, it's, it's true. Turtles, um, because of captivity, uh, you have to be careful. You can't, that's a Russian tortoise. We wouldn't ever want to introduce it or let it in contact with a native turtle around here because it could have diseases that our native turtles just aren't used to and can't handle. So that's a real big problem. Because there's so much captive breeding, you know that that breeds disease, and you don't want that to get out into the into the wild. But there are there are a lot of precautions. Um, we always sanitize after we touch each turtle, not for ourselves, but for the turtles. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you never want to introduce different species that aren't supposed to be there into wild populations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, Here's a, a physiology question. Uh, a lot of times people assume that the shells, uh, they can't feel anything. Is it true they actually, there are nerve endings. Yeah. Like if you pet their sh yeah. carapace it's, it's, or whatever, true. Yeah. they can actually feel they it. They can feel you, just like you could feel someone touch your fingernail. The top of their shell is covered in the same stuff our fingernails are made out of. And their shell is actually their ribs fused together and their spine is all fused in there. And so they can't come out. A lot of people ask you, what they look like when they come out of the shell. <laughs> they look awful. <laughs> so much less yeah. than that. <laughs> like a hamburger. <laughs> yeah, right. It's um, they, that cartoons you see them come out of the shell. Well, they can't really do that. So, the shell is part of their body and it grows with them, and they can feel it. When you you know crack their shell, the shell beats. 
And this is one reason why you should never pick them up by the tail. Mm -hmm. um, some people believe, oh, the way to pick up a snapping turtle is by the tail, mm -hmm. but you can break their spine. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of different ways you can move a snapping turtle. And if you take away nothing else from our talk, this is what you want to know, is you can safely move a snapping turtle without it biting you, even if it is completely terrified. Several different ways involve different um, different grips that if you're going to actually touch the turtle. One, I will demonstrate. Demonstrate on the turtle. Okay. Well, when you look at the plastron of a, of a snapping turtle, they do not have this um, modest Mayo design. They have like a Speedo bathing suit. And so there's, a, there's a, a big gap right here. It's almost like they're wearing a thong. And so you can put your fingers in here in this wheel well and hold the turtle. Well, <laughs> hold the turtle up like that. Yeah, yeah. When you can't hold be. it out like this, you grab the top of the carapace above the back two legs. And you just hold it out like that. And you can safely carry it. It can't, it can't bite you. It can't reach you. There's another one called a the platter lift. lift. And so if this is a turtle, you the snap turtle, you put your hand under the plastron. It can't bite down. If you put your hand there, the claws can't get you. And then you hold the base of the tail just for balance, mm -hmm. not any weight. And you just carry them like, like you're carrying a tray. <laughs> but there's other, there's other ways to move a snapper. Some of which, what you're doing on camera, I'm like handing the turtle. That's okay. Um, they're sweet. The problem is, all I want to do is look at them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Does that mean when, you, when you're picking them up, you come from behind? Mm -hmm. Yes. You have to just, just, you know, casually, or gently, just walk around, calmly walk around them, not to scare them, just go from behind them. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it takes a couple of minutes because sometimes people want to help and the turtle will be surrounded by like a whole circle of people and they're all like agitated and of course the turtle picks up on this. So send everyone away and just come around the back. Alexi and Natasha have come to pick up big snapping turtles in, in the road and there'll be like six burly cops standing around <laughs> and they won't know what to do. And then the two skinny ladies, one of whom is blind, show up and pick up the snapper who never does anything. Um, another thing that you can do if you don't want to touch the turtle, if that makes you really nervous, is if you're in a car, take out the floor mats and put it in front of the turtle. Let the turtle step on it. Go around back and then pull it backwards in the direction it's going and spin it around so that he's facing the direction that he was going. If you have a, a, a cardboard box in the car, you can unfold that. Um, years ago, I was happily um, in a car where a whole bunch of people stopped to help a snapping turtle across. And uh, one lady had one of those, it was a sled not on runners. It was, it was um, just saucer. smooth on the bottom. Yeah, flying saucer. And we got, we had, someone else had a shovel, and we just put the turtle on the flying saucer and dragged it across, and it was fine. So there's lots of ways. Sometimes the animal will just cross if you just stop the traffic. So that really helps because every turtle that you say, these animals will live. Snappers can live 100 years or more. Fire chief's going to outlive us, which is pretty great. And one of the, I say this too, one of the, the biggest things too, don't um, take turtles from the wild. We see a turtle and you know, you, it's a cute little animal, you sometimes want to take it and have it, but a turtle, each turtle, uh, a male or a female wood turtle will, will lay hundreds of eggs in its lifetime. And only one of those will make it to adulthood, to breeding age. So taking one turtle from the wild is really devastating. And the biggest, people don't realize this, the biggest threat, all those threats that I talked about, the biggest threat turtles face is poaching. And here in the Northeast, it's a huge problem. People don't realize this, but turtles are being taken from their different habitats and they're sent over to Asia. So it's all mostly for the pet trade, the illegal pet trade. So poaching is a huge problem. So even when we talk about turtles, we don't talk about any of the sites we're at because it all has to be secret because people will go and they'll take the turtles. We know this because researchers who published academic publications and revealed their study site gone back after the publication oh, and went on turtle oh, oh. Who would know? You know, who would who would think that? So for that reason we went to quite elaborate um, 
lengths not to reveal where the nesting site that we protect, for example, is. We've totally changed everything, including like the last names of the people that you couldn't look them up and all kinds of stuff like that. Because God, we, we know we have another friend. Um, many of you, if you're turtle lovers, you know David Carroll. Has anyone read his wonderful, wonderful books? Well, he drew a beautiful map of his study oh, wow. site. And this was before GPS, a global, Google Earth. Google Earth. And um, his favorite turtle, Ariadne, he hasn't seen her in 15 years. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason that she would otherwise be gone because she was a safe place and she wasn't a very old turtle. I met Ariadne. I actually have her footprint in um, my copy of one of his books. Mm -hmm. It was great to meet her. Any other questions? I have a question about Ruth. <laughs> Do you know how old Ruth is? Because people ask us that all the time, and we have no idea how old yeah. Ruth is. It's hard to tell. He doesn't look too old. Um, so turtles have each of these these segments. They're called scoots. And some turtles, like a Russian tortoise, they'll grow a new one each growing season. So almost like each year, you can count them like a tree ring. But usually only up until about 15 or 16, because then they start to get worn, they start to wear, and they start to get smooth, and you can't really tell anymore. An old turtle, uh, usually like a, a tortoise or a box turtle, they're usually really smooth. A wood turtle too, they're really polished, just polished by time. So it's really hard to tell. Um, so with a captive turtle, they may yeah. not get access to all that polishing, you know, because no, they're not crawling through vegetation all the time, yeah. etc. Maybe 20, I don't know, but yeah, it's hard to tell. Yeah, now, you've had him for how long? We've had him for almost 20 years. Okay. You've had him for 20 years, so then, yeah. He, and he was 30, handed down it to a few. Was he this people. big when you got him? Yeah. So, yeah, maybe 30? Yeah. <coughs> well, he's probably middle aged. <laughs> Um, because these guys will live 60, 70 years like us, so that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. And Ruth looks, looks really good, I think. <laughs> yep, All the males yeah. only get three inches long. It's tiny. Oh, well, it's big, big. And, there is, uh, and there is actually a, a, a must turtle, North, uh, eastern must turtle in North America. There's a, like a little dwarf population oh, wow. somewhere in the Carolinas. Which is about that size too. So. Musk turtles. I did not. He introduced me to musk turtles, and they do live here in New England. And guess where is this place to look for musk turtle? In a tree. <laughs> <laughs> they climb up trees and bask in the sun. Trees hanging over the water. Right. So if you know they can they snooze there, angle. and if yeah. something freaks them out, plop, they go right along <laughs> the tree. But apparently, they sleep really deeply. And so when Matt took me on one of the turtle expeditions. There, we, there he was, right up in the tree. And he tried to get him to musk for us, to sink for us, but um, he was too calm. <laughs> <laughs> he was scared. He was, he was a great, a great little turtle. <laughs> what, what type of turtles, little woods that you mentioned at first that we all carry around in our pockets in the 1950s? Oh yeah, that, those, those were red ears. Mostly red eared sliders, and um, they actually, if they are allowed to get big, they get this big. And mm -hmm. you know yeah. who has who has two of them? Of those celebrity, uh, it's uh, got St Sylvester <laughs> Stallone played Rocky. He had two, and I think they're still alive, and their names so, Huff and Link. <laughs> so those are turtles from the original movie. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we used to have a lot of, I think they were painted turtles in our neighborhood, which isn't very far from here. And I don't see them much anymore. Wow. Well, every now and then, but not, I used to see them all the time. Is that likely people taking them, or just, the habitat yeah. seems pretty darn good for that. Is, is there a busy road yet? Yeah, that's the problem. Well, there is a road, but it's not, yeah, it's reasonably busy, but I haven't seen any turtles. turtles are one of the people. Turtles that they're not right now threatened. Mm -hmm. They're actually doing okay. Or, okay. You know, amongst people, mm -hmm. they're pretty hardy turtles. But and there's a lot of more just subsidized predators. There's a lot more raccoons 
um, around oh, now because yeah. because of people's trash and, mm -hmm. and, and roads crows get and bigger ratings. and busier. I mean, yeah. roads. That, uh, I read studies mm -hmm. that basically said, you know, your turtle population it's going to be wiped out in ten years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, there's a um, there's a thing called flicker fusion ratio, and it's it's about the way you know your brain processes things that you see. And a hawk, for example, when it looks at a hummingbird's wing, the wing's not a blur like we see. They see every wing beat because their flicker fusion ratio is much higher. But turtles appear to have a low flicker fusion ratio, so they may, may not even see the car that hits them. They may not be able to even process that the car is there, even if they could do something about it. So roads are really deadly, even in beautiful habitat. And you're kind of like, well, why would you leave your your habitat? Often they they don't want to spend the winter in the same pond that they summer, because you need different conditions if you're going to be remaining immobile all winter long. In your summer pond, you want a lot of delicious things to eat. But in your winter pond, you want to be safe from predators. You want it to be a certain depth so that you don't freeze. You, you know, you're looking for something else. So you need a summer pond and a winter pond. And sometimes you can just go to a different part of your summer pond. But many <laughs> times they have to cross these roads. Other times they're looking for someone to lay their eggs. And they don't lay their eggs like right on the river bank or the pond bank. Many times they will go hundreds of yards and they'll at one of the, the sites where uh, we protect the nests, they go up these steep, steep banks. And our friends who live basically with these nesting grounds in their backyard, they've seen mother turtles climbing, 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 climbing up to the almost top, and then they roll back <laughs> down. And then they start again. And you know, why? Why do they do this? And then they come down another steep slope. And then they walk through this long, long area. And, but where you want to lay your eggs, again, has different requirements from where you want to, you know, eat your dinner. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have a very steep bank and a pond at the bottom. And every year we have snapping turtle come up and bury their eggs in our garden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't, we, I've never seen anything, any turtles. Well, it's not a bank, it's 200 foot steep in the pond. Yeah. You wouldn't even want to sugar. They, they come all the way up out of the pond. Oh, yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. They yeah. do this. It's amazing. But you know what? I mean, they may have hatched and be just fine. Many people look for eggshells outside, but that's a bad sign. If you see the eggshells near the nest, it means someone ate them. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. everyone eats You'll see an exit hole the eggs. And then yeah, we'll get covered up eventually and quickly, so. Yeah, so yeah. If, if you're you not seen seeing it, like, evidence, it means there's, if you're not seeing dead turtles and you're not seeing broken eggshells, probably yeah. they hatched them. Yeah. yeah. Where's, where do turtles go in the winter? Where, how do they survive in the snow? And yeah, well, the, the ones around here, the, the different conditions, but turtles um, roommate. It's like hibernation for a reptile, and so they, uh, snapping turtles, like the chief or painted turtles, those just stay under the ice. Yeah. In and the water. Under in the water, water, under the ice, in the mud, and they don't have to come up to breathe. They breathe through their butt, like we said. <laughs> so they can absorb oxygen through their cloaca. It's called cloacal respiration. <laughs> uh, so much nice. It's, yeah. It's like very that? bad breath. What? <laughs> yeah. They can go out with it. And uh, wood turtles will be usually in, in kind of trout quality rivers, and they'll stay under the ice. And they'll actually be active, a bit active in the winter, and they breed at the end of the winter during that cold time. So they're a really oh. cold weather turtle. I, see, so. I saw a turtle when I was 14, and it was, it was about that big, and I stopped, and I picked it up at like 4 and 7 o'clock to carry it across the, the road, and it, it was filthy, and it stank. It had been in a swamp or something. <laughs> and it turned its neck around to, to bite me, and it, inside its mouth was this gorgeous, Pink shell. I mean, it was this pristine, beautiful. Pink. I mean, it was the contrast between this stinking, crawling yeah. turtle and this yeah, beautiful mouth. It was great. Oh, I love oh, you saw that. That's so great. <laughs>
Um, the Echo Center in Burlington, I think, has an ongoing program to protect spiny soft shell. Oh, animals. great. And they overwinter little ones. Uh, Head start them? Yeah, yeah, and release them in the spring. And um, I, my question is, are there are there very many, are there other species of soft shell turtles? There, yeah. there, are, there are, not here. Um, and we don't even have spiny soft shell in New Hampshire. Um, but there are a lot of different soft shell turtles There's throughout, throughout the world. They're uh, raffidus, which is the biggest freshwater turtle in the world. There's only like one or two left. So it's a sad story. But um, they're huge, they're gigantic. And yeah, they're all, they're all, over, the, all over the world, different species of soft shell turtles. Yeah, and the soft shell, the spiny soft shell that you're talking about, that's the really that's fast, the fast one. one. Yeah. They can go faster than a child running yeah. 100. I've seen down. them when I'm kayaking on the Lamoille River. They're yeah, really quick. Um, Lake Champlain. And I guess the females are bigger than the males. And, you know, I've seen like big dinner plate sized ones. They're, they're so, so cool. cool. Oh, man, yeah. they're so cool with it. I yeah, okay. I, I was on a turtle survey in Florida and we were catching turtles and tagging them. And with pit tagging, but sometimes you'll notch them too. Notching is each each of these scoops, and, it's, and the edge has a different number assigned to it, so you can add up the ID number. Uh, you can't do that with a soft shell, but what you can do is you can tattoo a number on it with a tattoo gun. So my first tattoo that I ever gave was on a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> he also pit tagged another researcher by the state. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but one thing that I learned was that they still, even though the giant ocean tank is like extremely regulated and the temperature difference from winter to summer is really only a degree, um, and it's not even that because it's like 75 all year, um, there's not much change even in the floor of the fauna that's being filtered in from the harbor, but they still go through these like seasonal transitions of fasting and being more like still. And I was wondering if you could tell me about kind of internal map or mental map and internal map that turtles have where they are in the world that can kind of tell the differences. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question and it's a, I'm not quite sure. I, my, I have some turtles at home and my box turtles definitely change throughout the seasons and you know, even if it's in, in, the, in the house it's warm, they know that it's winter and it's going out again. Same with the chief, we have to keep him up. Yeah, oh my gosh, we had a big problem because the first year after Matt dug the pond, we didn't want to hibernate him because we didn't know the pond well enough. It was a brand new pond. So Charlie Innes, the uh, head vet at New England Aquarium, gave us this gigantic indoor tank. Um, but we moved him a little late and he wasn't eating. Oh no, so we took him to the vet. The vet was like thrilled. Oh, look at this big turtle. It was so exciting. And uh, by the way, he got out. I'm looking in the rear view mirror as we're driving the vet, and I see this huge head. <laughs> anyway, and um, he said, you know, we x rayed him. There's nothing wrong with him. Um, but they thought, you know, we might have to tube feed him. What are we going to do? So if he didn't eat by like Thursday, we were supposed to bring him back and two feed him and so on. We heated oh his God. water up, we brought the temperature up, tried to stimulate him. Oh, we did everything. We yeah. were, and we were trying to give him banana, he didn't want the banana, we didn't give him his nuggets, he didn't want the nuggets. <laughs> so I, I go to the Hancock Market on Main Street and I bought some fresh wild uh, salmon for like, that was selling for like $14 a pound. <laughs> but, I said, you know, thank you so much. You know who this is for? It's for a 42 pound snapping turtle who lives at Matt's house. And they're like, oh, take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he ate it. And so then I went back the next day. I said, I got to buy the rest of your, your salmon. And they said, here's six pounds. <laughs> that was a but, problem, though, because uh, for a while, he only wanted yeah. salmon for this. So we got him back to it. But it's a good question. There are different pressures and you know magnetic fields that we don't even know about that they can sense. Yeah, I was reading a this wonderful book called Our Moon by Andrew Boyle, which maybe you have here. And it's it says that even animals and plants being raised in darkness respond to the gravitational pull of the moon. So that blew my mind. So that's one of the I mean we just don't know about the senses. 
We have no idea. And just think how we err to, to dismiss these rich sensory lives. They're experiencing things that we'll never be able to sense. As Henry Beston said in the Alamost House, they're listening to voices we can never hear. It doesn't mean those voices aren't there. And when we get to know someone like Rubuka or Fire Chief or Tortzilla, Mr. Pajamas, <laughs> Chunky Chip, um, Tortzilla, uh, then we're touching another reality of our actual real living Earth. And it expands our capacity for experiencing this world. It expands our capacity for compassion, not just for other animals, but I think for each other. And the more different the animal, I think, the more elastic our capacity to love becomes. So I'm just so grateful to these creatures for showing us so much. It was their world long before we appeared. So thank you for Ruka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've